You have probably already read the title, so let's just get straight into it. I will probably forget a lot of stuff along the way, so feel free to add any tips in the comments below. The best way to explain how to defend in Total War is by first going over the basics. In the simplest way possible, Total War battles are in theory just a major game of rock, paper and scissors. Every unit has its strengths and weaknesses. Sword units counter spear units, spear units counter cavalry, cavalry counter skirmishers, skirmishers counter... Everything? I guess, if they are defended properly. To continue our trend, let's just say they counter elephants. So we can finish off the circle with elephants countering sword infantry. But of course, it is not that simple. Sword units are not just sword units but actually swords, axes, two-handed weapons and probably others I've forgotten about. Some of them giving armor piercing damage and others don't. Spears have hoplites and pikemen, both excellent for frontline, and the regular spearmen which are more focused on anti-cavalry. There are also shock melee and skirmish cavalry all granting very different sets of advantages. Units with lots of armor and the ones opting for movement and numbers. I can keep going, but you get the point. The main premise of this is you need to know this stuff, so you can deploy your units in the right spot to know how to reform your formation once you see the army of your opponent. But that we will talk about later as they also depend on the next part. In Total War, terrain can either be your greatest ally or worst enemy. A neutral strength that will help the player who seeks it out. The regular playing field is the most common of terrains. Here you will most often fight your opponent and all of your units will be shown, unless they have stalk of course, or are too far away. But if suddenly this field gets tilted a bit, the environment suddenly favors the one higher up. Initially that is. Charging uphill will lower your charge speed while also depleting your stamina faster, whereas it does the opposite for the ones charging downhill. If the two units fighting are the exact same, the one with the downhill charge will win 10 times out of 10. But the tricky part is to protect the hill advantage, cause if a hostile cavalry unit makes its way around to make a rear charge, that unit suddenly also gets the downhill charge straight into your back. How to defend that we will once again talk about later. But what you need to know about is this. Downhill charge, good. Uphill charge, not so much. A hill can also be used to hide units if deployed on the slope opposite of the enemy's location. A feature you can use to flank around your enemies on scene or straight up just lay an ambush. Defensively you can use this to get in behind the lines of your opponent and rear charge your way to victory with shock infantry and cavalry. The only annoying part is that they can easily get discovered if you are not careful because of the field of vision from a random unit accidentally standing in the right place. It has happened to me more than once. Instead a forest or shrubbery should suffice with a bit more consistency. In those it is at least possible to predict when the enemy will discover your unit. So preparing ambushes from a forest is viable too. On the other hand you could also just place your entire army inside the forest. Not only will it cloud your real numbers and formation, but also grant you protection from skirmishers and slow down an incoming cavalry charge. This also means your own skirmishers will be less effective, but as you are trying to stay defensive, I doubt that will matter too much for you. In theory, the main problem with deploying in a forest is the foliage, but as you can turn that off in the settings, it shouldn't really matter. Unless you want to stay immersed, that is. On rare occasions, you can even find impassable terrain that can act as a buffer for either your flanks or rear. This is a great opportunity for any defensive player to utilize if available. If it is a cliffside and you stay on the top of it, I recommend to have your shields face in that direction to cover for potential skirmish fire. But if that isn't possible because the enemy is approaching from the other direction, you can either use it to protect your rear or place yourself at the bottom and have your weapon side facing that direction. Just make sure to still contest the top of the cliff so your opponent 
can't use it against you. Flexibility is one of the greatest abilities that can give you the edge you need for defending yourself. Having units in reserve to fill the gaps of your line or bring support to whatever area you are under the most pressure. Not only that, but this will also deter enemy cavalry from doing rear charges or reaching your skirmishers. Mobility and speed can also be a strong feature. To give an example, if your opponent is only focusing on the flank, or one of your flanks, your units on the opposite side are rendered useless unless they can reach the other side in time. Therefore, having the ability to run from one side of your formation to the other in a short amount of time, it can be crucial in securing the victory. However, the difficult part is to know when to act. It is not that easy to define, but typically I would say once you see yourself being outnumbered, it is a reasonable idea to send reinforcements. If they are wavering, it is probably a must, possibly even too late. The most flexible units are probably the skirmishers. I prefer using them as a prevention unit against enemy cavalry as they can melt through these mounted units with swift speed, if given the chance. If the skirmishers are mounted, it is even better. Both extremely hard to kill and annoying if you strike. They can keep units occupied with their presence alone. They can chip away damage from the units on the flanks, take down enemy cavalry, scout the field and charge into combat. Depending on their armor, of course. This is why I always pick two of these kind of units for that sole reason alone. Maybe if there's a stalemate going on somewhere in the battle, you can use your reinforcements to perform our next topic, namely counterattacking. Unless you have the higher quality units, you can't just stay defensive and take all the punches your opponent throws at you. You will need to make your way around him to pin down his units from two fronts. A classic hammer and anvil basically. You can do this by either bringing your own units around his flanks, or perhaps by breaking his front line, allowing your own units to pour through. It is very situational on when to do this, as almost every battle is different. But usually it is whenever your opponent is stuck in combat or out of formation. Speaking of formation, the one you choose to use is very important for how you want to defend yourself. You can go for a balanced build like the Horns of the Buffalo, maybe the Oblique Order with a higher focus on avoiding combat altogether. Perhaps take the Wedge, but instead of trying to break through the center, make it have the focus to hold indefinitely. It is the one I usually go for when outnumbered, or need to clutch a victory. Using this seat though is one of my personal favorites for defense, because a good defense is a strong offense. Using stalk units to suddenly appear out of nowhere to cause havoc for your opponent is so damn powerful. All of these tactics you can hear more about in detail in some of my other videos. In terms of how you want to form up, it typically depends on how your army is built. We have a large variety of tactics on the channel you can check out to see what you prefer. But I can give you a few examples on where to deploy units and how they will affect you defensively. With defensive units like pikes and hoplites in mind, of course. Not any rush builds. The first place to start is in the center of your formation. This will often be the most solid units and the ones requiring the least micromanagement. I typically recommend 3 to 6 units here. The main advantage of having a smaller front line is that it allows you to be more aggressive on the flanks, whereas it will leave you vulnerable to be encircled if you have too few. To mitigate this, you can form smaller wings on either side. On either one or both sides of the center, typically one or two units on each flank. Their main task is to screen the flanks of the center and whatever skirmishes you have in behind. Either right behind or next to the wings, you can have whatever units you want to go on the counter offensive, or the spears needed to counter enemy cavalry. Keeping a unit in this position is smart as it grants you a small bit of depth and flexibility on the flanks. The main problem here is that it would take time to reach to the side, like I mentioned before. For that reason alone, it could be an idea to place most of your reserves in the center. This way you can easily reach whatever side you need. 
all it requires of you is that you will have to read the battlefield and know when and where to deploy them. In terms of skirmishers, I recommend to place them somewhere they are safe and have an advantage. Such an advantage could be to fire into the weapon side of the enemy, like if you place them on the left, or on a high ground where they are safe and sound, plus have a longer range. Maybe in a nearby forest along with other flanking units to hit the enemy from a second front. I would recommend no more than 3 units for this as it would leave your rear quite vulnerable. In terms of the army composition I typically go for the following template. 1 cavalry general, 2 melee or shock cavalry, 2 skirmish cavalry, 5 frontline units, 4 skirmishers, 4 anti-cavalry spearmen and 2 shock infantry. This is because it gives me the most balanced army with the tools to change into a dozen different tactics depending on what I'm facing. Then I would deploy them like this and use my skirmisher cavalry to scout the battlefield so I know how to properly reform my lines so I can counter my opponent. I don't really know that much else to say about this so I think I will just leave this here. Maybe we'll do a part 2 for everything we've missed. But until then. See ya.